Happy Sunday morning, everybody. My name is Scott Morgan, we're out the Motor City Madmouth, and we this is the professor and the pupil. Once again, enjoy having this show. Obviously, you know, my weekends get a little tied up because I'm very heavily involved with college football. But one of the advantages of being involved with college football is a man to my right, Brett James. I saw him at a USF FAU game a couple weeks ago. Well, Brett, why don't you introduce yourself to everybody? out there and let them know what you do hey scott well thank you for having me on this morning man happy sunday to everybody out there like scott alluded to i met him and his wife a uh, lovely couple uh, a couple sundays or excuse me a couple saturdays ago at raymond james stadium in tampa working that usf and fau game i've been a content creator on youtube now covering the jaguars and the magic for about two years but i've been a content creator for about four years now i'm a journalist reporter podcaster kind of everything that kind of culminates what the new media is in today's world and society and now i'm a credentialed media member for the orlando magic working at orlando magic hq i cover all the home games and yeah i'm just a huge lover of the game of football diehard basketball fan i love what i do i love covering content i love working these games and just a huge sports advocate man all right and of course my co-host the pundit himself jacob christner well Jacob and I do a lot of th projects together, namely the Pundits Pundit, which has come a long way. We do the sports exchange on Wednesday nights at 9 Eastern time. So, yeah. And Jacob fits in wherever else I need him. Go ahead, Jacob. Well, Brett, the one big thing about it is me with sports has been all my life. You know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. when I was growing up, music was that noise you heard at halftime of ball games. I don't know what that was. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? It, it's just like it, it, it's kind of like it's it's kind of like you would if you would have put Taylor Swift in the day on the in the middle of halftime, I would have gone out and got a hot dog. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, that, that that's what I was. I was just that way all my time. So just the way it is. And I and I just loved every sport. I'm a Cubs fan, Bears fan. I'm from Illinois. And and it's those type of deals. I live in Atlanta, Georgia now. So. You know, I just cover different, I get different things. I've done a few things for the sideline, but I do, I'm starting to get more for Scott. So I'm enjoying this whole thing. I've been doing this about three years now. And I've only awesome, been doing man. it over around 44 years, a little while ago. So you wonder why the name, the professor and the people is there. Well, a few more gray hairs, a lot more wear and tear and dot, dot, dot. So let me point out to everybody that the professor and the people being broadcast around the world the audio version of Professor and People can be heard on iHeartRadio, Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever you get your podcast. Please hit the red subscribe button on YouTube, South Florida Tribune. We're striving for a thousand subscribers. Please also comment, like, and share the broadcast. Want to be a guest? No problem. Just come in the chat room. That's one way to do it. Or send your topic idea to South Florida Tribune at gmail.com. Want to advertise cost efficiently? Give me a book call, 954-304-4941 or buzz, whatever, whatever language you want to use it. We broadcast live on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. Our website is www.southflorida.tribune.com. Twitter at slash X at Tribune South. Candy Eveling is behind the scenes. I am. I have a new book coming out real soon. It's called Lessons from the Microphone, Tuning into the Enduring Wisdom of Visionary Leaders. And, you know, I had a lot of fun writing the book, but it took a long time. I have about 15 chapters on it, so I'll give you more details about the release. All right, now that you survived these first three or four minutes of introductions, let's get to the meat of the broadcast. All right, according to Front Office Sports, once the NBA finalizes its upcoming media rights agreements, it, expect, it is expected to expand to include 32 teams. The cities that are under consideration are Las Vegas and Seattle. Start off with Mr. Basketball himself, Brett James. you like Las Vegas and Seattle, or do you have any other alternatives? If I was to pick an alternative between those two cities outside of Vegas and Seattle, I'm leaning heavy towards Kansas City. Kansas City's fan base, when you look at the Royals, you've obviously looked at the Chiefs and what they've done in these last couple of seasons, their dominance in the AFC, the fandom and the fan base that they've really built there in Kansas City. I think that would be a terrific city. But if I'm picking between Las Vegas and Seattle, I have to go back to the hometown roots, the Seattle Su Supersonics, and I got to give a team back to Seattle. When you also look at that fan base, and the kind of culture that they've built in Seattle and in the Pacific Northwest. You look at the 12th man with the Seattle Seahawks. I think giving an NBA team, an expansion team, back to that city after they were then brought over to Oklahoma City, I think Seattle's the perfect choice to go for when you talk but about they, an NBA expansion team. Yeah, but if they but you get two here, okay. So mm -hmm. so you obviously spoken about Seattle. What would be your second choice? Kansas City. 
Kansas City. I'm not I'm not the biggest proponent to Vegas getting another sports franchise, not because it wouldn't bring in a lot of revenue. And obviously with Nevada, there's no state income tax. So that might be a draw for a lot of athletes. But when you look at Vegas and really the sports culture, in my opinion, you're looking at more so away fans. When you look at other cities, big cities, like the Los Angeles Rams and the Los Angeles Chargers, once they went to SoFi, that's essentially a place for away teams and away fans to go to. That's kind of how I view Vegas, especially when you look at the Raiders and their new stadium and their facilities. To me, I'm not really the biggest proponent of Vegas getting an NBA team. I really like Kansas City and Seattle to kind of get those. Okay, well, let's run with Jacob. I have a hard time thinking about Kansas City. I love Kansas City, being from Illinois. You know what I'm saying? Being from mm -hmm. Illinois, Midwestern, I love the idea, but I'm doubting it. And the reason being is because you're bringing it up itself, like the no state income tax, you know? Plus mm -hmm. the fact that Las Vegas twice has had a situation where they nearly went broke. First was the economic collapse. Second was COVID. They are not trusting their, they are not trusting just gambling anymore. Not this isn't the time of casino, the movie casino, or any of the time of uh, Ocean's Eleven and all those times where you trusted that and people went out for the shows and that. They're not trusting that anymore. So they're going to try to make, I mean, no matter what, from here on out, sports is going to give them their billions. They're not going to go nearly broke again. So I see Las Vegas, absolutely. Seattle, without a question. Seattle, without a question, because they should have never lost it in the first place. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, the, the Supersonics were very popular. This isn't like you were loose. This isn't like, well, this is almost the equivalent of Cleveland with the Browns. Very, very popular, and you get the um, owner do what he did. That's wrong. And I think Seattle needs that back, including their jersey and everything like that, like nothing happened. So I'm going to say that in Seattle. Kansas City, the issue is everything has turned tribal. With uh, Everything's turned tribal in this world, and that's a Midwestern state. And it's the same with Nashville with baseball. It's hard for me to believe until I see it that they're going to give these chances to these people because – you're making the, the pe uh, people they may not like or a certain people don't like, a media may not like a stadium and, you know, it's some kind of pleasure. So until that point, I'm doubting it. But so I do see Las Vegas and Seattle. All right. Well, you know what? You bring up some good points. So let me, let's go do a little bit of backtracking. Once upon a time, Kansas City had a team and then they were called the Kansas City Kings. And then they went to the Kansas mm -hmm. City Omaha Kings and they played at the Kemper Arena. And then ended up subsequently moving to Sacramento was their last stop is where they're at. Now, bear in mind, okay, they have a facility in place called the T-Mobile Center, which used to be the Sprint Center. And that facility mm -hmm. holds right now, as I look at it, 18,972. So it's ready. It's built. They're looking for an anchor tenant. So uh, you know what, Brett? I'm kind of with you to some extent. Mm -hmm. But Seattle's a no-brainer. They should, should never have lost that team in the first place. Ve Vegas, you know, they obviously have the NBA Summer League, but they're going to build a stadium, and they're ultimately going to get one. And they probably might – that way they'll have two franchises on the West Coast. There might be a little bit of realignment. But here's a wild card. You ready? How about St. Louis? Oh, yeah. And I, I – from being from two hours away from St. Louis – I've been trying my hardest to get a uh, third. They're trying my hardest to talk people and talk everything, whether from here into a third chance for St. Louis football, just because I really believe it would work there if, if an owner would give it a shot. And yeah, not talking about Cronky, uh, who lost his Midwestern roots. Yeah, talking about somebody. Once upon a time, you had the St. Louis Hawks. Yeah, I know. Hawks. 58, 1958 champions. Yeah. Look at this guy. Look at that. Getting a little smarter with that basketball. But, you know, but I guess the front runners. It's safe to say Seattle, Vegas, but don't rule out Kansas City. And I don't think St. Louis has even talked about any place. But, but well, no, the St. Louis is because St. Louis as a city's falling apart. I mean, if you drive mm -hmm. through the infrastructure, infrastructure has not been. I mean, my town called Quincy, Illinois, has has improved itself more than St. Louis has, and it's forty thousand people. You drive through the infrastructure, and it looks to run down. It's hard to get things. St. Louis Cardinals will always stay. St. Louis. I mean, St. Louis Rams left, but the, the everything mm -hmm. like that, those type of the St. Louis Blues will never leave. Not that I'd see from that. And if they did, it'd be over for the city. Well, okay. So we have good comments all the way around. All right. Charles Barkley. I love this guy. He's unbelievable. 
And you know what? I had an opportunity to meet him in North Carolina. Even better in person as he is on the air, personable. But talks about load management, his favorite topic. If you're going to make 50 or 60 million a year to play basketball three or four days a week, play basketball, man. All right, Brett. Thoughts on thoughts on load management. I think Charles Barley, Barkley uh, nails it on the head. Coming from a generation where load management has kind of really picked itself up, right? When you go back to the San Antonio Spurs days of Greg Popovich, load management of Tim Duncan, Tony Parker, Ginobili, et cetera, and kind of how we've seen that trickle down into Kawhi Leonard and other superstars across the league. I'm absolutely all for everything that Charles Barkley is saying in reference to load management. You've had other superstar players like Anthony Edwards and Jason Tatum speak up about how they're going to go out there and they're going to play because no matter if they're playing Charlotte or they're playing a primetime game on TNT that's nationally televised versus the Lakers or another big opponent, there's fans out there that are tuning in, that are traveling, that are paying money for their kids to maybe have an opportunity to go see their favorite player, right? And this goes for more than just the product of the game on a game-by-game -game basis. This goes for the quality and the imagery of the entire NBA here in the United States and internationally speaking, you pay your best players. You want these guys to play. If you're genuinely injured, you genuinely have uh, family issues to take mm -hmm. of personal issues to take of nobody's debating that, but load management, especially in an 82 game regular season that needs to be addressed. Superstars and players should not be sitting out just due to load management. I'm all for it. And that's why you're trying to value the regular season more by having an in-season tournament, incentivizing players to keep playing, and also having 20 out of 30 teams making the postseason by having the the uh, the play-in tournament as well, too. So you're incentivizing to value the regular season, which means that players really have to continue playing for seeding-wise. So I'm all for it. Well, the only thing I'll say is AC Greens don't grow on trees. He's the NBA all Iron Man. I mean, it's unheard of. I remember Michael Jordan used to play 82. Anybody that could play 82 mm -hmm. did. Load management's wrecking basketball. If you have to negotiate 65 games to qualify for awards, that's absurd. They have an NBA in-season tournament, which <laughs> is laughable. But, all right, we'll turn over to Mr. Opinion. Well, Mr. Fact, I have to say. Now, <laughs> the, the, big thing I, the big thing I bring up is I grew up with Demi and Sin. This is why Scott likes me, Brett. I grew up with Larry Bird, absolute mm -hmm. hero. You talk about somebody who squeezed every inch of himself – until he was gone. Every inch of his ability, every inch of his body, every inch of his um, whatever he had left. And I always like to joke, and I said this on one of our shows when we did Basket Bros, I said that load management in those days was when you took a dump at halftime. But it's, but now, but these day and age, but see, right. this is what I've been saying though. The issue we have is that the sports, not just basketball, but not anything, but they're run by lawyers. They're run by agents. You get, you think about, we're going to go just for that second, You th uh, just for the second off of the basketball, I'm going to say, you think of Anthony Richardson who got brought number one, I mean, like a number two or something, like a top of the area. It's because he was, I mean, he can bring kids in. He can bring kids in, bringing them into with the jerseys and all that kind of stuff, and they buy that stuff. They're looking at trying to get the younger generation, and they'll get that. They're giving that for a reason. The agents, the same agents that do that are the same ones are going to say, I don't want my guy getting hurt. That is my uh, golden goose. I don't want him getting hurt. I, don't, I want him to rest when needed. It's like you get the things like a, you get things like a Jimmy Butler saying game three, I'm out. I got to rest. You know what I'm saying? Which you, are which you, you referring to game three of the conference semifinals versus the no, Knicks? No, game three of this to? year. Game three okay. of this year, he said he was out for rest. Okay. I thought you were referring to last year's conference semifinals. No, he, he had was an out injury. during the game. He was correct, back during correct. game three for rest. And it's correct. like, you couldn't have that. You couldn't have that in those days. You lose your job. And it was necessary. We need, the biggest thing is we owe, in, our, in this United States, whether it is one side or the other, we overcorrect ourselves. We do. We completely overcorrect the situation constantly. It's like, we don't want them to get hurt. So we're just going to put them in bubble wrap. We're going to, we, I mean, it's like, we want our guys to make millions. So we're not, we'll put them in bubble wrap. We have this problem with this. We can't have common sense. Not anymore. Not with the internet, not with 24 hour news. And that's where the problem lies. And it's like, can it, you want to know how it gets solved. 
you get the NBA's version of Matt Stafford. You get the NBA's version of Josh Allen, the one that want to play every single second that they can. Mm -hmm. It's like they make their own decisions. See, those are the ones that are going to lose an agent. Those are the ones that will lose an agent or two before they done set in because those agents don't those agents don't want the tough guy. They want the money maker. Interesting points. Well, let me tell you this. I think we can all agree on this. Jimmy Butler could have played in any era of basketball. This guy, Absolutely. to me, in my opinion, is, gives it everything he's got, and he's probably the most misunderstood NBA player in the game. He really is, and I think he's found a nice home with Pat Riley, and he feels comfortable with the Miami Heat culture. Miami, I don't do much with the Miami Heat. In fact, I don't do much with the NBA these days because I'm so wrapped up in 9 million other projects. It's just hard to get to them all. But the Miami Heat culture is unbelievable. You got Pat Riley, Eric Spolstra, stability with the coach, as well as the prime executive. I and mean, it doesn't get any better, but I, I think Jimmy Butler. But the bottom line is this, this. Okay. The NBA has gone out there and had their play-in tournament, you know, that use every gimmick that you can. Okay. But the bottom line is, like you mentioned, Brett, people are paying a lot of money to see these games. And if they're not there, that's a good way to destroy the game. And that's a good way to destroy the game quick. You want to tinker with your all-star format to make it interesting? Now they decide to go back to the east-west format. As they should. Mm -hmm. As they should. Right. But they should never have left it in the first place, Brett. Mm -hmm. But everybody's I trying to outthink themselves with every decision here. Play up, show up, like Charles Barkley says, play basketball. And then you can go out there and, to me, when you play basketball, show what you're – these guys are great athletes. Show that you're great athletes that are willing to play 82 games. I understand a couple of games here and there. But even back then, you could see a lot of guys that played 82 games. Mm -hmm. Just don't have that anymore. I mean, you know, I during the bad boys era, it was the greatest time for me to cover it because I saw some of those hard-nosed individuals mm -hmm. that you could – have on the team anything you want to add to that yeah just uh i think from my perspective especially with how much the game has changed right we're not just talking productivity and availability of you know playing 80 81 82 games like i think just the way the game has changed the skill set the talent i'm i'm personally okay with players playing 65 mm -hmm. plus games right i think that should be bare minimum right obviously i'm negating injuries right i'm putting that to the side right we're assuming health i'm personally okay if you know a guy misses 10 to 15 games not necessarily saying load management you know but i can live with that right I, i'm i'm okay with that i understand that um it's completely unrealistic in today's nba and today's generation to expect guys to play 75 plus games and if they do they're a mirage right um so I just wanted to say I'm I'm personally okay with that. I understand everybody's got their issues. Um, some coaches are planning for, hey, I'm trying to win a championship. Couldn't care less what these people think. I'm trying to take care of my job and my team right now. So there's a multitude of things that go into it. Um, I see everybody's vantage point with it too. But um, for the most part, I definitely lean with uh, Charles Barkley and agree with him. Yeah, well, let oh. me tell you. Well, but let me add to this now that you mentioned that, okay? This is why I really disagree. If you can at all – possibility mm -hmm. like 75 or more you need to do it period mm -hmm. number two one of the things that's wrecked the game of basketball mm -hmm. is it's become a jump shooting league instead of driving to the basket and you've taken away the physicality of it and i disagree I with that though well you what i disagree with that take though because well, I've, okay. I've i've gotten to watch both both eras of it too but you know what though I have no problem with anybody disagreeing with anything because that's exactly mm -hmm. what it's all about. A free spirit show where we have opinions. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, but I think I don't like a game, which to me is all nothing but jump shots. I like mm -hmm. the physicality driving to the basket, get the three point play the old fashioned way. They earn it, but I have mm -hmm. zero issue with anybody ever disagreeing with me here. But to me, 75 game. Now I understand an injury, a major injury, different story. Let's remember Greg Popovich is the one who initiated all of this in the first place. So, mm -hmm. you know, and he's the one who brought load management and seems to have picked up. So more power to you. That's why you're well, on the show. You know, you have opinions. It's like I do. Go ahead, Jacob. Well, Brett, we also have one more thing too. I bring this up with the media. It's like, you, you, when I brought up Larry Bird, like I did, and that's a bygone era, gone. You know what I say? As much as I hate that, it is true. And it's a bygone era. When I bring that up, media used to bring up the toughness of a player. 
now there is a very big thing of uh, with media of itself that to be a little softer, to be a little more victim by itself. That is given more the leeway to the thing. So being so, they're not going to the media is not going to give anybody any heat outside of you know the way real people on the internet for um, for missing games. You used to get a lot of heat for missing games. Remember Derrick Rose years ago. He used to get a, he got a lot of heat when he missed games after when he didn't feel ready to play with his knee. Now you don't get this kind of heat, at least from the media. You get it online, but you're not gonna mm-hmm. you'll get it online, but that's just from people that are our age, he and I's age. But you're not gonna, but that's the big thing about this. It's like they're gonna get these players are gonna get the media side now, unlike the four. Well, here's another thing, Brett, okay. I like the fact that you disagreed on my take, but all you have to understand is why the NBA is regressing in popularity. Think about it, right? Well, there, I, I mean, see. I that's fine. I disagree with that as well, too. I well, think you know, why the NBA is becoming, it, I think I think people are questioning, and and rightfully so, because everyone's entitled to their own opinions. The like the validity and the actual product of the game as well, too, like you've talked about. But I think on an international global scale, I still think you see how popular. The game is you look at the talent uh, gap across the, about across the world. I just hold on, man. Let me interrupt you there. OK, I don't have a problem with the international brand. You're introducing something entirely different than the old conventional NBA. What you're doing here. OK, let me just tell you this. What you're doing here is comparing the Rolex 24 versus NASCAR is what you really are. And then you're talking about bringing the international game in compared to the NBA. That's a different story. You want to talk about a different topic on down the road when you come back on professor and pupil we could talk about international basketball because you know i remember hear me out okay when the detroit red wings brought in those russian five and all of a sudden you open up the talent pool across the pond it's a different story so i agree internationally to me basketball has never been better and the quality of talent that you're bringing in so go ahead then mean inter- i just want to get that point out while it's fresh in my head no, 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 you're, you're completely fine. And no, I agree with you on, on that take. I'm saying the NBA product, not necessarily just international play and how much basketball is run. I'm saying the NBA's product, I think, has grown internationally and still domestically. You see how they reach out to the younger audiences. You see them on every commercial, shoe wear. You see them on every Instagram post, Facebook post, etc. So I disagree with that statement because the billions of revenue that the NBA generates, even – here in the United States, I still think is extremely significant. Um, I don't necessarily see anything wrong with the way the game has changed. Obviously, yeah, I do agree. It's obviously extremely um, a jump shooting league. The skill, talent, and the talent level is completely different than what it was 20 years ago, the physicality, et cetera. So just kind of everything that is culminated into NBA's game today, the media, like you guys refer to as well, too. Just times have changed in the game and media and how – we view basketball, especially the NBA, it's just completely changed from what it's been 10, 15, 20 years ago. You ever and, met, you ever met J.J. Friend. Redick? Of course I remember J.J. Redick. That was the first Magic team I ever watched growing up with J.J. and Hito right. and have, Jameer Nelson. Have you, ever met, have you ever met him? Never met the guy personally. Boy, I'll tell you, you sound like J.J. Redick. He's defending today's – the NBA's best ambassador is J.J. Redick, and I'll tell I mean, you – he's a shooter. He's he's exactly. one of the greatest shooters ever. Made, right, and you just made my point. Thank you. All mm-hmm. right, over to Jacob. Well, and, yeah, the you know, another thing that I brought up in um, Pundit's Pundit, and I brought this part up, and this is a good point to make here, is that the reason of the change by itself – and I'm talking about all sports – the, I, the kids, because I had a friend of mine once, I'd say a year ago or so, he's an old friend from uh, high school. He reminded me that 53% of kids watch the whole game the way we used to. Like sit down, pop down, watch. Most of it is highlights now. Most of it is highlights. And that has followed to adults because there's a lot of people look at the highlights over the nuance they mm-hmm. constantly do, and that's the way that – so they're trying now, like whether NFL being the um, Toy Story game, whether NBA having all of those fl- – the, all the flashy um, – all the, all the flashy um, – what's the thing? Like, like the uh, entrances for the All-Star games and stuff like that. Everything is made to go get kids in there to watch the whole way because there are more distractions to them now. And they're trying – would you have still the generation – our generation that's still 90% watching 
theirs is 53. Well, we die one day. We die one day and those people won't change. Mm -hmm. Those kids won't change from adults. They're going to keep their habits. So they're trying to do what they can be able to do. So I get that point. Well, I'll tell you one thing, though, Brett. First act here with me. I'm really, I'm really impressed because I enjoy having the opportunity to match wits ends with you because you know what, what you really are to me is exactly, you know, this generation, old school versus new school. And I think that's really mm -hmm. important that when we talk about sports in this day and age, how you compare how it was versus how it is. And I think there's a good blend on both ends. So, you know, I always encourage people in the chat room to do what you're doing here live in front of us. So more power to you. All right. Final topic of the day, the NFL game that you're looking forward to seeing today. All right, Brett, what are you looking forward to seeing? Uh, NFC East showdown, Philadelphia Eagles, Dallas Cowboys. I believe the game is in Philadelphia, if I'm not mistaken, at Lincoln Financial. Extremely excited for that game. The Kansas City Chiefs and the Miami Dolphins are playing as we record right now in Germany. That's an interesting matchup. Obviously, I'm not exactly sure what's going on in the game right now. But Philly, Dallas, obviously two rivals. Jalen Hurts and the Philadelphia Eagles are sitting at 7-1. and one. The Dallas Cowboys desperately need a win over a big-time opponent after they got slacked by the 49ers. They got three consecutive wins afterwards as well, too. But I don't think that the Cowboys this season have had that notable, marketable win that says, okay, like we're one of the premier contenders and the NFC. They've really beaten up on a lot of mediocre teams, a lot of teams that aren't all that great. And I think that they desperately need this win in order to try to keep up with the Philadelphia Eagles in the NFC East. I'm just super intrigued with this matchup. Okay. Jacob. Well, for one thing, I was absolutely intrigued with Kansas City and Miami all week long. I love it. So far, it's kind of a blowout. But you never know with Miami, they can score in bunches. But mm -hmm. my main thing is being a Bears fan, I am now intrigued because I want to see where they're going to go. I'm intrigued for the rest of the year. The whole thing that I've had is uh, the whole thing I've had from day one. Um, Justin Fields to me was never uh, Justin Fields to me was never ever given a chance, and he has fans that are not given it. His fans by themselves are absolute stalkers. I call them the Field Swifties. They're not. They they don't care if. They don't care if there's a win, if there if there's winning, if there's highlights. And so he was never given a chance or built around. So now I want to see what Bajan does for the rest of the year. I know they're going to probably put Fields back, but I want to see Bajan most of the year because what do you do if he succeeds in anything? What do you do? But if he fails, you're going to the you're going once again to the um, draft pick. You're going to probably Caleb Williams or Drake May or any of those. So I'm interested now for the rest of the year. Before before I wasn't that interested. You just watch. Because I because the way that they've dealt with him, the way they've dealt with him with Fields, it's just made it a nightmare compared to where the Bears were. So I want to see this game for the rest of the year. Scott, okay. before you jump in here really quickly, let me say something. So I'm I'm a little confused because you're calling the Fields fans that are, you know, com Field completely Swifties. dismissing him. Field Swifties, correct, sorry. Um, and saying they've never given him a chance, but you're also saying like, – No, no, I no. Still, I, I just want to make sure I'm hearing you correctly. They – okay. They themselves are care about TikTok, YouTube, three-minute shots. He mm – -hmm. the guy misses – the guy misses so much. You know what I'm saying? He okay. misses so many plays. He and he, but he makes very dynamic plays, but he misses so much. He get he takes him so long to get rid of the ball. But everybody looks at the three minutes on their YouTube, and so because of that, the Bears themselves have not anywhere near built around him. Didn't give him a. They gave him DJ Moore, but they didn't give him an offensive line. They haven't get mm -hmm. the runners. They'll give stuff, but they don't have any blocking. I was about to say they didn't have. They lost David Montgomery. It. Yep, Matt Eberflus is never the right guy either. Exactly, and they didn't give him a right coach. And that's my mm -hmm. point on it: is when a when a cheap front office like the Bears always are, that see that somebody's going to watch anyway, and those people are going to be so them they're going to be slobbering at the guy, you know, like he's walking. I mean, he's slobbering him like he's a walking idol. When you do that, the Bears won't win, and it's like I, and they weren't going to. No, and I think that's a very valid point. Um, are you suggesting, though, because you, you referred to, you know, Drake May, Caleb Williams, they'll probably be in the race for that as well, too. Are you suggesting that the Bears move on from Justin Fields? Or oh, are you I've been suggesting saying that from, I've been saying that from right I just, here. I, 
so so you are suggesting i just want to make sure no i know i've been saying that from rookie year you haven't met me yet on the thing i have been this okay. way and that's not a personal affront on him mm -hmm. i like him he's a hard worker he wants to win and that's part of my thing my issue is the fact that i want these fans to suffer they hated they hated on the last guy even if he wasn't perfect he won everything there was winning as a full team winning there wasn't any highlights uh, that you would get on that and then when Bajit won his first game they went all over the online saying how unexciting it was because there was a lot of drop-offs no it was a team win and I'm sick of these type of fans and I want them to follow him out and and, and I and I look I can only sympathize with you because I'm not a Bears fan I've the best Bears quarterback I've seen in my lifetime is Jay Cutler unfortunately yeah. they have not yeah. had a quarterback since what Rex Grossman it, no, Jim wrong. McMahon, really. Jim McMahon. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so I'm just saying in my lifetime, the Bears have not had a yeah. quarterback. I'm just going to keep it plain and simple. Jay Cutler yeah. was serviceable, better than average, but that's your best quarterback in my lifetime. So I think you're selling out on the fans from my perspective by saying, okay, we're going to go into the Caleb Williams, Drake May sweepstakes and just restart this entire process all over again. After trading up from 20, everything you package up with the New York Giants to move up to 12, take Justin Fields, that's on front office and that's on personnel and Ryan Poles in this organization for not properly developing him, getting him the right coaching staff, getting him the right team around him like you uh, addressed the offensive line and developing him. We see plenty of young quarterbacks and Trevor Lawrence is a prime example of it. Coaching matters. Situation matters. You get mm -hmm. a young quarterback who is extremely impressionable mm -hmm. into a horrendous situation, especially in their rookie season. When they don't know any better, you throw them out into the fire, kind of as you should. But you get the right coach around him, you get the right scheme around him, and you get players mm -hmm. to protect him, and you get they're going to help him in the skill position players. That's what you do. I don't think you sell your fans on, hey, we're going to go and go ahead and pick in the top three again this year because we have two top three picks, and we're going to go for Marvin Harrison Jr. and a quarterback, and then just restart this whole process. I say you clean front office, and you continue to build around Justin Fields. Even if you want to throw out the whole rookie quarterback contract, I, I don't think you're, you're just restarting the whole process too. Uh, and, Either and clean house with the front office, but uh, no, you know, that's just I, my I, thoughts I, on the bear situation. I no, I apologize, Brad. No, the thing, my issue was, is when I said the last guy and I did, and here's the thing with it. Justin Fields is a better overall quarterback than Mitchell Trubisky. We already know. I know this part. I know this as far as his skill. But the team was winning, and Bears fans got revenge on the guy. He was a nice guy who did the work, did everything. He was part of a team that was winning games. It was the only winning they've had in the, other than the lovey time in the last, you know. And, yeah, it wasn't a defense. Yes. Was it a good running game? Yes. But it was part of and, – and he made plays. He did make plays, but he wasn't the main thing. You know what I'm saying? But it was game part manager, of the – Yeah. And it's like – but it was part of winning. And it's where I'm mad at the fans is they taking we're bears are literally six and 25 with him. It is the worst thing that we've, I have ever seen in my life. And it was like, and is that fields his fault? No, but they wanted flash and they've wanted this the last 20 years. They mm -hmm. wanted it with Grossman. They wanted it with Cutler over Orton. They with both of them when there was winning already, they always want flash and now it's come back to bite. Okay. Interesting points on both ends. The game of the week that I'm interested in seeing is the Buffalo Bills five and three at Cincinnati four and three. That'll be tonight on NBC. See, Demar Hamlin is not expected to play tonight. He suffered cardiac arrest on January the second, and the game was eventually canceled. Well, this is a time of the year where Joe Burrow, okay, becomes cool Joe, and that he takes the next step during the second half. He's been able to weather a lot of injuries. And, of course, the game is being played at Cincinnati. These are two teams that could make some noise in the postseason. So, you know, I'll be anxious to see what we have tonight. You guys have any thoughts on this game before we call it a day? Mm -hmm. it, you know, the big thing I, get, I like is the fact, you know, the thing about it is Joe Burrow is making – Joe Burrow by itself, he's, he struggles early. I don't know if he likes cold weather or something like that and it really gets to him. I don't know what it is. But they're starting to make their run, and the Bills are just not consistent. Right. Bills are not consistent, and it's like they can easily get 40 tonight, or they can get absolutely stomped. 
Well, Jake, I, like, I that's remember part... that Joe Burrow is from Ohio, so it's not yeah. like he can't handle cold weather. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He plays true. a year in LSU. What are we anointing this guy to be a Southern guy when he's from Ohio and wanted to play in Cincinnati, where yeah. most people really didn't want to play, but yet it's his neck of the woods. So, hey, Joe Burrow, you know one thing. I really, really like this guy. I hope he wins the Super Bowl at some point or another. But, you know, he has some weapons as well. Jamar Chase, I believe, is one of them, and the list goes on. I'm not going to really mention all of them. But this is the time of the year where certain teams under Zach Taylor and that Cincinnati Bengals know that they realize it's not a sprint, but it's a what, – what, what do they call it? Not a sprint, but it's a uh, – help me out on that. Uh, it's a marathon. marathon. Marathon, thank you. So, sprint, not a race, yeah, or yeah, yeah. Not but a these guys have acclimated. Sprint, yeah. They've been consistent. Cincinnati's been a good story the last few years. They really have. Yeah, yeah. They gave the Rams a game, actually in the Rams building for the Super Bowl. So, Joe Burrow, you only can wish you have a guy that could stabilize the locker room. And Joe Cool is definitely the right name. I mean, you now the only thing I wonder about, I know that the Bills are. You know, watching Demar Hamlin's situation, the last thing we want to see is another cardiac problem on national TV. Though I know it was a freak incident to begin with. And let me tell both of you, Jacob already knows, but you haven't, Brett. I was at the only game in NFL history where a player died on the field, Jacques Hughes, in 1971. And he didn't survive. Okay, so I say that is I'm glad that Demar Hamlin had all the necessary medical help he was able to get. And I, it just shows you how far our medical, modern medicine has taken it. But I think that the last thing, especially on a game like tonight, is you don't want Damar Hamlin, you don't want to talk about that thing too much. And I think sometimes we want to avoid publicity, especially with situations that happened recently to bring him up when there's still a football game to be played. So he's not, he's not playing tonight. I don't think, but it's no, like, he's, that's not. Been, he's not, that's no. the point. I've, I've made this on pundits, pundit, Brett. I made this point on there. The thing I did not want him coming back. He came back because he was two years. You get a pension after four. And, and the biggest thing is he's played one game and it was like, and this is unfair to him. It's unfair with the team. It's another roster spot in there. They did it just for the feel good. But he, by the biggest thing is, this was absolutely what was meant to come, and especially when he's played one game this year, and he's still another year away. If he can get a full year, he gets his pension, but they can let him go right at that spot, and he doesn't get it. Yeah. Any thoughts on this? Very well, right. um, more so on the game, or Demar Hamlin, or both? Demar, but I'm saying Demar. It's like DeMar. that can very well yeah. happen. It's like he's played one game this year. And they could mm -hmm. easily let him go before he's met, um, uh, viable go, and oh. nobody else pick him up for fear of the heart thing, and before his pension comes through. Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, the team has all the authority in the world to, you know, do as they please when it comes to cutting him, waving him, or any player for that matter. Um, yeah, of course, there would have been a lot of backlash had that happened. But you also notice the end of the end, very end of the day to business, you're trying to get a roster of 52, 53 men out there, best personnel every single Sunday, and if Demar's not one of those 53, then they're going to unfortunately have to move on from him because that's just the name of the game at the very end of the day. Um, so, I mean, when I watched that game personally live on television, I mean, I think everybody, and I can only imagine the people at the game in attendance, were just as heartfelt, confused, stomach dropped. Um, that's how I felt in my room when I was watching it as well, too. And like you said um, earlier, Scott, uh, it's crazy to see how far modern medicine has came and that we could be able to help him because that was obviously a very scary situation, I think, for everybody in the football community. But um, no, I mean, I'll just kind of moving off of that, too, though. I'm really excited for this game as well, too. Obviously, AFC South, or excuse me, AFC showdown. And, you know, Joe Burrow does play well always this time of the year. Like you said, I don't know if it is the cold weather. He's really picked it up. He had a great game last weekend versus San Francisco, three touchdowns and a big win over them. And Buffalo, like you said, is extremely sporadic. Josh Allen, Bills quarterback Josh Allen, is one of the most inconsistent quarterbacks in the NFL. He can go out there one week, have a perfect passer rating, go out there, throw four touchdowns and no interceptions, or he can be the other team's best player. You know, he leads the NFL in turnovers since coming into the league in 2018. So it, it kind of falls on his shoulders tonight. I think at the end of the day, this is going to be a Josh Allen type of game. And, but I like Cincinnati to go out there and get the win tonight at home. You know what? I'm with you all the way, Brett. I, I like Cincinnati. The, the 
game is at home. So I'm with you all the way. I, you know, Buffalo to me is like a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde team. You don't know what you're going to get week in and week out. And I know mm-hmm. Von Miller, I think, is due if he's not already back. So hopefully bringing him back might help the Buffalo defense to some extent. So, yeah, he came back in London versus Jacksonville. Did he? Okay. I knew he came mm-hmm. back recently. I haven't been able to monitor that at all. And I think part of the problem that we have too is with some of those London games, I don't think they're. Had a couple on the NFL Network, and I think one of them was on an app. I don't remember, but I know that at some point you got to make those games accessible to all, and not depend on an app. And that's you know the topic of the other day. So, anyways, that concludes this edition of the Professor and the Pupil. So I'm going to give Brett an opportunity to let everybody know how they get a hold of him. Yeah, uh, just want to say great first episode. Thank you so much for having me on. Um, no Definitely had a lot of uh, had a lot of great conversations, good debates, good dialogue that we had going on as well too. Uh, you can find my YouTube uh, at the Brett James, or excuse me, my Twitter and my Instagram handle are both at the Brett James one. And then on YouTube, you can find me at Brett James. You can find all my articles. You can find all of my LinkedIn and all of my socials really connected uh, with my link tree as well too. So you'll be able to find everything on there as well too. Okay, Jacob, go ahead. Um, I am the Jake the Pundit at Jake the Pundit on Twitter. Jake, the, I will not say X. Jake the Pundit one on TikTok. I am the Jacob Christner on Facebook, both my actor and my um, media one. I have um, I have got those. I'm on Sunday night Sunday mornings with him with you guys with the professor and pupil. Monday nights with um, Top Rope Talk with the Sniper and the Pundit. We talk pro wrestling. Wednesday nights is um, Wednesday nights is Cup Fidential. I do show with the Cubs. And the um, and sports exchange Thursday nights is pundits pundit, and and then I also work on acting part time, and I also got some, and that you will get your writing soon, Mister uh, <laughs> the uh, South Florida. He's so, a writer, what he wants to be, and a really good one. So I'm yes. looking forward to it. All right, one last time here, the professor and the people are being broadcast around the world. The audio version of Professor and People can be heard on iHeart Radio, Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever you get your podcast. Please hit the red subscribe button on YouTube, South Florida Tribune. We're striving for a thousand subscribers. Please also comment, like, and share the broadcast. Want to be a guest? No problem. Chat room is one way to do it. Or send your topic ideas, South Florida Tribune at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. Want to advertise cost efficiently? Call me at 954 304 4941. We broadcast live on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. Website www.southfloridatribune.com. Twitter slash X at Tribune South. Candy Ambling's behind the scenes. And as I mentioned earlier, in case you missed it, I have a book coming out. It's a media book. Lessons from the microphone, tuning into the enduring wisdom of visionary leaders. And actually, Brett, I talk about the Chuck Hughes situation in it. So, you know, and I have a lot of other things. And this is a good book, especially for budding journalists and pretty much anybody that wants to learn a bit about old school media versus new school media and everything you want to learn about the industry, how, how to build a podcast and try to make sure it's sustainable when you have enough good content ideas. So I, I'll pass on more information as we get it. So once again, Brett James, good first act, Jake Gubb, the pundit pundit. I always expect what I expect out of you, nothing less than what you're capable of providing, which is great commentating as always. So on behalf of my two, my two, Brett and Jacob, this is Scott Morgan, Roth Motor City Madmouth. Thank you for joining us on this edition of the Professor and the Pupil. One score update at halftime, Kansas City 21, Miami nothing. So that's where we're at. So we will see you on the next edition. And... Have yourself a wonderful Sunday, everybody. Bye now.